So we have been discussing the two major types of bonding for our class, ionic bonding, which occurs between metals and nonmetals and involves the transfer of valence electrons. And then also we've discussed covalent bonding, which occurs between nonmetals and involves the sharing of electrons. So these would be the two extremes in bonding, where on one side we have a transfer of electrons, and on the other side we have equal sharing of the electrons. So what we're going to talk about now, and what I'm going to introduce, is something that comes in between those, which is called a polar covalent bond. Now covalent still means that they're shared, but we're going to talk about this word polar covalent, which, uh, just thinking about it or letting you know ahead of time, means a unequal sharing. So let's talk a little bit more about unequal sharing. So there's a value called the electronegativity value. And um, you can see the definition right here on the top sentence. So it just says electro electronegativity is a measure of an atom's attraction for electrons in a bond. So I kind of think of it as it's a value, so it's a number, and we'll look at the numbers a little more closely. And this number um, tells you how much an atom wants or desires or is attracted to the valence electrons in the bond. And the higher the number is, or the electronegativity value, the greater that atom's attraction for those electrons in the bond is. So if you look at this table, which is from your textbook, um, and let me just also mention that you are not responsible for memorizing electronegativity values. Um, this chart will be given to you. So you'll be given electronegativity values. Um, our periodic table that we use, uh, use, use does not contain electronegativity values. Sometimes that is one of the numbers that they will place on uh, a periodic table, um, but ours doesn't have it. So you'll receive a separate table. And if you look at the numbers, the highest one is right here with fluorine. And the trend is as you go from left to right or across, the electronegativity increases. And since fluorine is the highest, as you go up a column, the electronegativity value increases. So if we think about this trend, the nonmetals, fluorine, for example, has the highest. And if you in, uh, look closely, then down here, the metals have the lowest. Now, one thing we might start connecting already, if you recall, metals lose their electrons and nonmetals gain electrons. So what happens when you have metals and nonmetals is that the nonmetals electronegativity value or their attractive power for the electrons is so much greater than the metals that it actually pulls or transfers the electron from that metal to the higher electronegativity nonmetal. So we start to see how, remember the, the line between metals and metals is right here. And so we start to see how these values are reflected in the types of elements that like to transfer electrons. Um, now, the other thing before we leave this table, you may have noticed that there is something missing and it would belong right here. And that's the noble gases. 
Now, you might um, think, oh, that's a mistake, but it's not. If you look at the definition again, electronegativity has to do with bonding. And so noble gases, since they already have a complete valence shell or a complete octet, we do not predict that they would bond, and so they do not have electronegativity values. So because they don't have that attraction for atoms in uh, for electrons in a bond because they are already satisfied or happy with their electron configuration. So on the electronegativity chart, the noble gases are missing, but it's not a mistake. It's because they do not have electronegativity values. So let's see how we can apply electronegativity to the idea of that intermediate type of bond between ionic and covalent or purely covalent, um, what is called the polar covalent bond. So um, if we look at this chart, the first part here, so right here, the first half of this page, there's something called the polar covalent bond and you can see right here in this first sentence that it occurs when the two atoms have different electronegativity. So what happens is the element with a higher electronegativity will attract the electron cloud from the shared electrons toward it, okay? That creates something called it's a partial separation, but it's called a dipole. So let's look at the examples here of HCl. Now what I would like to do is go back to our electronegativity chart, and I'm going to look up chlorine, which is right there, and chlorine has the number of 3.0, and hydrogen is over here. It has a number of 2.1. I'm just going to write those numbers underneath. So those are the electronegativity values. Now, the, the higher the number, the greater the attraction. So the electron cloud, and they've tried to illustrate it here, is pulled toward the higher electronegative atom. So in this case, since 3 is greater than 2.1, you'll see in that illustration right here that they've tried to draw the electron cloud larger around the chlorine. That's because it has a greater attraction. Now what happens is electrons, just remember, are negative charge. So if the chlorine pulls a negative charge toward itself, it becomes slightly or partially negative. And that's what that little symbol means here. So this is a Greek letter, delta. It's a low, whoops, I can't spell, delta. It's the lowercase delta, an uppercase delta. Just for reference, the uppercase delta is the triangle, okay? But we're looking at the lowercase, the little thing that looks like a weird S or a partial eight. It's delta, and what it's going to mean for us is like partial. Oh, sometimes I think of it a little bit is kind of what I think of it. So when the electron cloud is pulled toward one of the atoms, that atom becomes a little bit negative, which then, as a result, you have the other atom being a little bit positive. Okay. That, having a part of an, a bond as a little bit negative and a little bit positive, is called a dipole. There's two poles, the positive and the negative, that's created by a separation of the charge.
So let's look at the second illustration, which also kind of shows it in a different way. Um, that's this one. And it doesn't draw the cloud. It shows the shared pair there. And what we see is, again, chlorine would have a 3. And hydrogen has a 2.1. So the electrons are drawn toward chlorine. And as a result, the chlorine is partially negative. And the hydrogen, the one with the lower electronegativity, is partially positive. Um, when you have a partial negative and a partial positive, again, they, that the language is that's a separation of the charge because you have the two things separated, and that creates what's called, known as a dipole. So, uh, elements that have a uh, a dipole or a separation of the charge created because you have two different uh, electronegativities, their electrons are shared unequally. So polar covalent bonds occur because the electrons are shared unequally because they have different electronegativities. Now, one thing I can say is the atom with the higher electronegativity always is the one that is partially negative, always. Right, because it, the higher electronegativity means that it is going to draw the electrons toward itself. It has a greater attraction, and electrons are negative. So atoms with the higher electronegativity are always going to be the ones that are partially negative. So this is the in-between. So you have an, in an ionic bond, you have um, a difference in electronegativity that is so great that the electron is transferred. It's lost by the metal and gained by the nonmetal. In polar covalent bonds, you have a difference in electronegativity um, that's not so great it creates a... Uh, transfer of electrons, but instead you have the electrons unequally shared. Now the other extreme on here is right here. It's called nonpolar, or on the previous slide they just said purely covalent. The prefix non means not. So a nonpolar covalent bond is occurs when the elements have similar electronegativity. And so that means that the electron pair is not pulled toward one atom or the other. And so as a consequence, the electrons are shared equally. So it's pure, they're purely shared equally. So let's see how we can apply this to bonds using our electronegativity values and uh, a couple examples. So on this slide, on the bottom here, it just has another illustration of the continuum, how you go from being covalent, purely covalent, which they're really talking about nonpolar, so sharing equally, in through an intermediate phase, which is polar, that's where they're shared unequally, all the way to ionic. So it's this continuum, and in our imagination or desire to classify things, we're going to make boundaries. And we're going to say, okay, 0.5 is a boundary, and if you are all the way up to 0.5, you are going to be nonpolar. Then if you're between 0.5 and all the way up to 1.9, then you are polar 
and if your uh, if your difference goes up to uh, the the highest, you're ionic. And so here's a table that lets you know this. And so it says if you just read the top screen, bond polarity is determined by the difference. That just means subtracting the electronegativity of the two atoms sharing the electrons. So you just subtract their electronegativity values. If the difference is uh, less than 0.5, you would have nonpolar. If it's between 1.5 and 1, sorry, 0.5 and 1.9, it's polar. That's where they're shared unequally. And in that situation, they are all, the electrons are always poor, pulled toward the more electronegative element. And then if you have a difference that's greater than 1.9, your electrons are transferred. So now let's take this sheet and look at a couple practice. I do want to mention I do not give you this sheet with your exam. So I do give you the electronegativity values, but this summary is not given with your exam. All right, so up here I have an electronegativity chart and I'm just gonna give us a couple examples. So let's say we had um, hydrogen and oxygen. So if I look here, hydrogen is a 2.1 and oxygen is a 3.5. So to figure out what type of bond we have here, we would say 3.5 minus 2.1. You always subtract the higher number minus the lower number. So the difference will never be a negative number. It will never go below zero. So higher number minus lower number. This is 1.4. And 1.4 falls in the polar category. Now, polar covalent bonds are the only ones that require the little delta signs um, because they're the only ones that share unequally and create a dipole. So in this case, the oxygen would be the negative one because it has the higher electronegativity and the hydrogen would be the positive one. So there's one example. A second example, why don't we take nitrogen and have it bonded to another nitrogen? Well, anytime you have two nonmetals bonded together, they have the same electronegativity, and so their difference is always zero. So if the difference is zero, this is a nonpolar covalent bond. Now remember, the difference doesn't have to be zero to be nonpolar. It can go all the way up really to 0.4. Once you hit 0.5, you're now not sharing equally. But if you had a difference of 0.3 or 0.4, it would still be considered shared equally. So it's nonpolar. This is also a good time to bring up that notice a polar bond has a difference between 0.5 and 1.9. So not all polar bonds are equal. Some bonds actually are more polar than others because the greater the difference, the more polar that bond is. So let's do one more and then we'll look at this practice problem. Let's do an ionic one. So let's say we have sodium and we'll put it with chlorine. So sodium is 0.9 and chlorine is 3.0. So if I say 3.0 minus 0.9, I get 2.1. That is greater than 1.9. Well, really it's 1.9 and, no, just greater than 1.9, sorry. Greater than 1.9, and so that is an ionic bond. And there's no only one that has the little deltas again are the polar covalent. Um, let me also just mention, so the 1.9 in the 0.5 is used in your textbook. 
Um, the 0 0.5 is the cutoff between polar and nonpolar is pretty consistent, but the top number I've seen anywhere from 1.7 to 1.9. So if you're doing work like this in a textbook or for an instructor, you might find out um, either by reading the textbook or listening to the instructor where that cutoff is for that particular class. Because I have seen it, like I mentioned, anywhere from 1.7 to 1.9. Your textbook uses 1.9, so we're gonna use that as the cutoff between being a polar bond, sharing unequally, and an ionic bond, which is a transfer. So let's look at this question, and it is a multiple choice question. It says, a polar covalent bond would form between which two atoms? Go ahead and pause and see if you can answer this question. And then you, when you unpause, we will answer it together. All right, so to answer this question, um, you would look through and you would look, so there's BE, which is what, 1.3 or 1.5? It looks, I'm going to say 1.5, but I could be wrong because it's kind of blurry. Let me see if it's on the other page and I can see better. Uh, let's see, BE, it's still, I think it's 1.5. Okay, so 1.5 and fluorine I know is 4. That's a big difference, isn't it? So 2.5. Okay, so this is a polar covalent bond. Okay, nope, this one would be ionic. We did, oh no, we didn't do HCl above. Let's see, that was on a previous one. So H is 2.1. Oh, and look there, I wrote it different, but I subtracted correctly. Do the higher one oh, first. It's always positive. Let's see, and this is 3.0. So 3.0 minus 2.1 is 0.9. Okay, so this one is polar. Let's just look at the other ones. Sodium is 0 0.9. Oxygen is 3.5. So 3.5 minus 0 0.9. What is that? 2.6? Uh, 2.456. And then, um, so that's also ionic. And then F and F would be 4 on both of them. So 4 minus 4, which is 0. So this is nonpolar covalent. So the correct answer here if you did was B. And one thing I always ask you to do is write which one would be negative. Because chlorine has the higher electronegativity value, it would be the negative one and hydrogen would be the positive one. All right, so what we just did is use electronegativity to determine the polarity of a bond. So we weren't trying to classify the compound. If we just class, if we're given a formula and they ask us if it's a polar or, uh, I mean, sorry, a covalent or an ionic molecule, we can just look at the different types of elements. But in this case, if they ask us to determine if a bond is polar, nonpolar, or ionic using electronegativity values, then we use this table and look at their differences to determine the type of bond.